folks, Dr. Travis McMacken here. Welcome or welcome back, as the case may be. Thank you for choosing to spend a bit of your day with me. I hope that I can at least help you to think some interesting thoughts. I'll be back with you in a moment after the music ends. Today we tackle paragraph four of Bart's Gertigan Dogmatics. I'm going to read the title and then just kind of let that hang there, and then I'm going to read the diktat stats, and then I'm going to circle back uh, to something pertaining to the title. So, uh, paragraph four, man and his question. Here's the diktat stats. God's revelation, which is the basis of Christian preaching, is the answer to our question how we can overcome the contradiction in our existence, which we have to view not as our destiny, but as our responsible act, and which we know that we cannot overcome. But we know ourselves in this regard only as God makes himself known to us. We would not ask about God had God not already answered us. Because of this, we can neither evade the question about God nor settle it in any sense. And that is the end of the diktat sats. So, uh, the editor have, has placed a translation note uh, in the title of this section uh, about the word man. And this is what the editor has to say, so I'm quoting from the note. In this translation, we have, for the most part, avoided terms that have come to be regarded as sexist. In this section, however, we could have done this only with the help of clumsy circumlocutions and artificial constructions which are anachronistic in content. It should be understood that in retaining quote-unquote man, we are using it as the primary, in the primary generic sense for the German mensch, which was generally recognized and accepted at, that, at the time when Bart delivered these lectures. End quote. So uh, man is standing in here uh, for humanity. Now, I find this an interesting note, and it kind of brings to the forefront development in the English language um, since I have been alive. This book was originally published in 1990, and in 1990, apparently, uh, style, English style with reference to gender, was in a very different place. As I read through this section, I kind of kept it in the back of my mind to think about any places where I thought it impossible to replace the word man, uh, that it would require a clumsy circumlocution, um, and honestly, I could not find any, um, whether it's because I'm accustomed to different stylistic uh, priorities, or if it's just a simple thing like inside the last five years, um, American Dialect Society has accepted the singular they. Uh, which is a, is a big deal in terms of how you, you make sense of gender-neutral language. Um, but anyway, reading this has just brought these issues to the forefront for me uh, for reflection about how language style changes and translations uh, bear the markings of their own particular time and place, just like the primary text does in terms of the language that is used. In my own speech in this section, I'm going to use, do my best not to use the gendered reference to humanity uh, in general, uh, unless I am quoting something from the text here. Which brings us to section one, the concept of man. So, Bart introduces uh, his theological anthropology here uh, and wants to make sure that he stays in contact with everything that he has said so far about preaching, about how theology takes its bearings from preaching. And so as he raises this question, he has to think about how it fits in with preaching. And the answer that he has is that when we talk about humanity we're talk and God, we're talking about the whence and the whither of Christian preaching. Christian preaching always comes from God, that's the whence, and it's always on the way to humanity. That's the whither. So that's how he locates this uh, section in relationship to what went before, as well as in relationship to everything that's going to come after. And he wants to say that preaching at its best aims at what is human in people. And what he means by this is that basic humanity that all human beings share, and not just particular aspects of personality or, per, uh, or certain cultural expectations and so on that you might find in any single individual or time and place. So preaching needs to aim at 
what is the human in people. And so there's a quote here from page 70 that I'm going to read to elucidate uh, what Bart is talking about here. What sermons aim at is the human in people, not their morality that needs confirming and strengthening, not their devotion that needs to be piously nurtured, not their culture that needs religious underpinnings, not their nationality and its peculiar values that need to be conserved, not the bourgeois element in them that longs for peace and order, and naturally not the proletarian element in them that seeks justification for its dissatisfaction and rebelliousness. People are all these things, but not the human in them. And I'm going to pause in the quote right there because I find it fascinating about that these are the things that Bart picks. When he's talking about morality needing strengthening, uh, the pious nurture of devotion, we can think about these things as uh, uniquely connected with liberal theology in the 19th century. When you talk about culture needing religious underpinnings, nationality, and its peculiar values, uh, it's hard to separate this from uh, the Union of Germany in the last late 19th century and then the loss in World War I. Uh, lots of uh, movements in church and theology at this time uh, that Bart is writing were very concerned with um, undergirding German culture and uh, supporting German nationality. So he's saying these are not the important things. Uh, and then he, there's the bourgeois and the proletarian comment. I think we see here uh, that Bart is, by the time he's writing the Gerdigan Dogmatics, solidly um, planted in his stance that we cannot identify the kingdom of God with any particular political program, whether that be bourgeois or proletarian. And we certainly cannot uh, think that preaching is meant only to confirm one or the other of these desires here from the bourgeois or the proletarian side. Preaching is about something that goes beyond that. So I'm going to pick the uh, quote back up again. People are all these things, but not the human in them. The distinction must be considered at least as exactly as the distinction between God, capital G, and the gods. It is only a hair's breadth from this. If preaching does not press on through all those things, through them indeed, but still through them, to the fortress which is the seat of man, arrogantly and despairingly entrenched behind them, if it does not see their relativity even in human terms but remains stuck in them, if it does not begin with the presupposition that man wants to be taken more seriously by it than he takes himself, namely with total seriousness, then it is setting its sights too low, and its effort is meaningless, no matter how great its sound and fury. And that's the end of my quote there. So, um, all of these other factors can be part of preaching. They're sort of the, the surface level of humanity that preaching has to go through in order to get at the depth grammar of what it means to be human so to speak. You go through the surface or the public concerns, this is some language that Bart uses in this section, through the public face of humanity to get at the arcane concerns, the secret, the hidden concerns of humanity. Or if we want to talk uh, in Paul Tillich's language, we could say ultimate concerns. So Bart is really interested here in making sure that preaching is existentially significant. Uh, addressing what is human in all of us and not just those different things that make us individuals in particular times and places. We can't ignore that. We have to go through that, but that isn't the point. And there's an analogy here, I think, to Barth's doctrine of Scripture where, again, you have to go through the particular words of the witnesses uh, preserved in the text to engage with the Word of God. Uh, you can't ignore them. You have to go through them, but they are not themselves the point. So we see a similar pattern here in uh, preaching. So you go through all of these human things to get at what is existentially significant. That's what preaching needs to do. That's the main point he's making in the first section on the concept of man. In the second section, he asks the question, what is man? And he's very much invested here in making sure that we're moving from theology to philosophy and not the reverse. So this is something that we're very used to seeing in Bart. It's a concern that is always present with him uh, throughout his work, making sure we have the proper order in our methodology. So he's concerned with not, not with humanity in general, not with humanity as such, but humanity as addressed by Christian preaching. So again, taking his starting point from preaching and working out his, his method from there, 
when he asks the question, what is man? It's, it's what does it mean that the human being is addressed by Christian preaching? What does that address tell us about what it means to be human? And, other, and this is another way of getting at what the human is in people. So, uh, this is how Bart puts it. What must man be because revelation is? What must man be because revelation is? So, assuming that revelation is, then what does that mean for humanity? And the first point that he wants to make here is that it means humanity is alienated from God. It presupposes that there's an alienation here that should not be there. And that's important. He's going to circle back to that. But there's an alienation, a contradiction, a separateness from God that should not exist. And uh, this produces a lack of rest. He talks about it that way. He talks about it as a contradiction in human existence. He talks about it as an insecurity in human existence. On page uh, 73, he even has a reference, it seems to me, to Romans 7, although it's not flagged in the text. Uh, Bart speaking of the quote-unquote man that is addressed uh, by preaching. Uh, they know the good, uh, I, I can't fix it here on the fly, he knows the good that he ought to do, but as he knows it, and the better he knows it, he also knows that he does not do it and never will. So again, a reference to Romans 7, Paul talking about how in his pre-Christian life he knew uh, the good that had to be done but could not do it. And um, I'm always uh, careful in using this passage. There's lots of different ways you can interpret it. The interpretation that I find convincing is that Paul is engaged in a post facto description of what life uh, prior to encounter with Jesus means. Um, Not that he's describing a particular existential existence that he could have described prior to that encounter. And again, it's a post factum explanation. And so I think Bard is doing the same kind of thing. We're talking about humanity as described or as experienced after encountering the Word of God. So it's not an independent sort of description here that he's giving us. And this contradiction ultimately, uh, for Bart, means that there's a lack of self-knowledge. He says that uh, people do not know themselves, they can't handle themselves or be satisfied with themselves. Um, So this idea that it's impossible to know yourself under these conditions, under the conditions of contradiction, of insecurity, uh, of lack of rest that arises from this alienation that should not be, this makes me think, and again, Bart does not flag this himself, but this makes me think very much of the opening section of Calvin's Institutes about how knowledge of God and knowledge of self belong inseparably together. And uh, critically, Bart says that this contradiction, this alienation, it's not something that humans can overcome for themselves. It has to be overcome by God. That's another thing that he's drawing analytically out of the idea that this is humanity understood on the basis of Christian preaching. And he concludes uh, by circling back to the question of philosophy. Uh, He set up this general picture about humanity and alienation and insecure and and so on. And he says, uh, and this is going to be a longer quote, we may agree in passing that the general picture of this man is not unknown in philosophical reflection or deeper self-reflection in general. I have explicitly indicated this by means of various allusions. In the attempt to understand himself, if it is not undertaken in a trifling and bungling manner, man can understand the basic features of his whole structure only as he has to be understood as one who is addressed by God's word. So there's certain elements here in, in general and broad strokes that um, find resonance in other uh, non-Christian reflections about what it means to be human, especially uh, what Bart brings up at the top of page 74, the idea that, quote, every desire wants eternity, end quote. So part of the alienation is this longing for eternity, which means there's an awareness of death, there's an awareness of finitude, and at least in those kinds of general terms, you can find resources in philosophy, as Bard has done. You can find them in other religious traditions, as he does not do in this section, that make similar points. Uh, so there is something here uh, 
that is recognizable. But Bart wants to say uh, that the order in which you work through this material is important. So we're going to pick up again in the quote. In the attempt to understand himself, if it is not undertaken in a trifling and bungling manner, man can understand the basic features of his whole structure only as he has to be understood as one who is addressed by God's word. The contact that we make with philosophy at this point is welcome to us as a secondary confirmation that even from a human standpoint, we have not been describing a phantom, but the form that anyone might know. I think that with or without this support from philosophy, we may be may quietly assume that as Christian preachers, we are addressing real man, the man in men, the secret man and not the public man, when we accept this depiction of man. So, uh, we have certain dovetailings that occur with philosophy, but they always come secondarily. You start your analysis from uh, Christian preaching and what that tells us about what it means to be human, and then if we find echoes of this in other places, that can confirm, but it does not itself ground the analysis. And this is similar uh, to what we find in somebody like Clement of Alexandria, for instance. Clement uh, lived in the 2nd and 3rd century CE. Uh, he was one of the uh, important thinkers associated with the Alexandrian Academy uh, of Christian teaching. Uh, he was Origen's teacher, uh, if you need another uh, bigger name to associate with him. Uh, but in his engagement with Greek philosophy, he would find certain strands of that philosophy that dovetailed with the theological points that he was trying to make on the basis of uh, his understanding of the gospel. But they always came in secondarily. They were not independent proofs of the truth of that gospel. And Bart wants to be, seems to want to follow a similar pattern in his analysis. Which brings us uh, to the third section, man as pilgrim. So, the contradiction, Bart wants to say, that, ident that we can identify in human life on the basis of Christian preaching, the alienation that's there, the separation from God that should not be, Bart wants to make very clear that this is a curse. Uh, it is disorder. It is not something that God intends. It's not part of divine order. So, it's disorder, disruption, and curse not part of divinely willed order. And that's some language that Bart's using. And he has here a, re a positive reference to Marcion. Marcion, the ancient 2nd century Christian heretic uh, who um, claimed that the God of the Old Testament was separate from the God of the New Testament uh, and was eventually um, uh, kicked out of the church in Rome uh, for these opinions and rejected. And uh, the rejection of Marcion is generally understood to be very important in the development of Christian thinking because it's, it's uh, in rejecting Marcion, it affirms that the God of uh, Judaism and the God of Christianity are in fact the same God, uh, even though uh, there are better and worse ways uh, to think through that. So it's a, it's a little jarring to see Bart appeal to Marcion here in a positive reference. Uh, so Bart says, the ancient heretic Marcion chose the better part here in contrast to the oversynthetic thinking of the main church, both past and present, little though we may applaud his demiurge. demiurge. Uh, the demiurge uh, for Marcion was the being, the, the supernatural being that actually did the creating of uh, the material world, and often this was associated uh, in Marcion's mind with the quote-unquote God of the Old Testament. So Barth's saying, we don't want to go in that direction, I'm not applauding the Demiurge, but what Marcion got right is the idea that you can't wrap up all of uh, the created order and the, the created existence as uh, a simple synthetic um, uh, explanation of what God wills. God cannot will these things uh, in the same way in any kind of simplistic sense. And he sets Marcion up in his rejection of this against people like Origen, Zwingli, Schleiermacher, and Hegel. So let me read a little bit more from, uh, from here, uh, from Barth. 
Unlike speculative thinkers in every age, from Origen by way of Zwingli to Schleiermacher and Hegel, we must not view man's alienation from God as a stage in God's will that man necessarily had to go through as a process that could not have been different. And then dropping down a little bit further, God is not glorified by our using the concepts of creation and providence to sanctify that which, from a Christian standpoint at least, is unholy and has to be overcome. Even as the creator and ruler of all things, God can be praised only by calling upon him in our need. And this is a very pastoral concern that we're seeing in Bart here. Uh, this is the, the same line of thought that would tell you uh, if you are pastorally counseling somebody who is grieving, the last thing you want to do is to say that, oh, this terrible thing that has happened is all part of God's plan. Bart is saying that there's a, a moral problem here if we want to associate the destruction and sin, the disorder, the disruption, the alienation of uh, existence. If we want to say that's part of God's plan, then that's a problem. Bart says that it's not uh, part of God's plan. It is, in fact, a curse that results from human action, and we have to resist every impulse to synthesize it in some neat way and make it part of of a greater whole. And so in his praise of Marcion, he's saying Marcion uh, resisted that synthetic impulse, whereas other aspects of the Christian tradition did not. So uh, that's the first point that Bart wants to make about man as pilgrim. The second point is that uh, he's talking here primarily about a uh, matter of human existence and not just a conceptual problem. So the whole idea that there is this disruption, this curse, um, this disorder, this alienation, this contradiction, all of that has existential significance rather than merely conceptual significance. So Bart talks about this all being part of, quote, the real dialectic of life, end quote, not just a conceptual game. So preaching has to aim at that real dialectic of life. And so at the very end of the second point, he says, quote, God's address is to pilgrim man himself, not to his philosophical shadow. So it's not about getting into the pulpit and playing conceptual games in front of your congregation. It's about speaking directly to the real dialectic of their life, their ec- that existential level where they live. And this is like what we saw him saying earlier, that it has to go through the particularities, uh, the particularities of culture and nationality and, and economic class and so on are not the point, but you can't ignore them either. You have to go through them to address what is human in people. And that is this existential contradiction. That's his second point. The third point is that we're dealing here with a human fault, not fate. And this goes back to his first point about the synthesis. Uh, If we made uh, evil and disorder and so on uh, and put it in a synthesis with all God's other works of creation, then that would make this disruption fate. It's something that humans cannot avoid and is not really their fault. It comes to them from the outside. But Bart wants to say that this is human fault. Uh, Quote, the rift goes through our existence because we cause it ourselves and are not just spectators of this tragedy. End quote. So it's fault, not fate. And in that way, as he comes to the end of the section, he also uses the term sin. Ultimately, this is sin. And then his fourth point about man as pilgrim is that this condition, this pilgrim condition in the midst of the disruption and the existential contradiction, that is a final condition as far as human possibility is concerned. It is not simply a stage again on the way to some greater synthesis. And then he says, apart from divine possibility, this is all that human beings can expect. Only God for Bart can enter into human existence and break the dialectic cycle. And so I'm going to read a quote here uh, from Bart from page 78 that explains this a bit and elaborates it. It will not do to accept the contradiction and then to give the assurance that something which transcends it, a third and higher thing, a synthesis in which the antitheses can come to rest, presses upon us so ineluctably that we cannot avoid positing it as real and therefore overcoming the contradiction. 
It is we who rather boldly dare to do this, and it is we who still engage in the contradiction as we do so. For in so doing, how are we in any position to do anything but posit a new contradiction? Nor will it do to accept the impossibility of overcoming the contradiction and then to make it all the object of a dialectical reversal, attaining in this way to the saving position of making a truly radical negation and then promptly altering the sign and securing a happy ending on the ground that because a contradiction that we cannot remove is one side of the equation, its overturning is its conceptually necessary counterpart. Certainly we can and must think this, but we can only think it. Thinking the possibility that is the opposite of an impossibility does not alter the finality of the impossibility. On the contrary, it confirms it. So he's engaged here in playing with uh, dialect, uh, Hegelian dialectic and its various applications in modern theology. And he's saying no matter how you slice this dialectic, you're trapped inside it. So ultimately, it is only God who can break humanity out of it. And this also goes for Jesus, Bart says. And this is a really interesting point, I think. He wants to say that not even Jesus, considered in terms of Jesus' humanity, can get you out of this contradiction. And here, uh, and he says, we should not introduce this reference as a final human attempt. So talking about Jesus, you can't bring in Jesus as a final human attempt to break out of this dialectic. And I, he doesn't mention it, but I think that he may be referring to Schleiermacher here, or certainly to theologians who have Schleier, followed in Schleiermacher's vein, because there's a sense in which Schleiermacher sets up what Jesus accomplishes in, in developing a perfectly potent God consciousness as built in to a historical process. And there's lots of complicated conceptual arguments to be made about exactly how Schleiermacher does this, and is Bart being fair to him, and so on. Uh, that's all well and good, uh, but I suspect that this is what Bart has in mind, the idea that you can build the emergence of Jesus as some part of a developmental process, an evolutionary process, and therefore uh, as another stage that needs to be moved through uh, on the basis of possibilities and potencies uh, embedded in the created order. Bart wants to say, no, there is nothing within the created order that can move us out of this contradiction, not even Jesus. So I'm going to read a quote here uh, from Bart on page 79 that gets into this a bit. When I say that the contradiction is final, I mean that no word that man speaks as subject is the word of reconciliation, not even the word Jesus Christ, which is not a magic formula. I'm going to stop the quote there because this reminds me of a place in Church Dogmatics 1-2 where Bart talks about Jesus' olatry, the way that in Christianity of a certain stripe, and I think we see this a lot today in contemporary English language church circles, especially in America, there's an elevation of this person, Jesus, uh, that loses track of the theological significance so that you get a kind of Jesus solitary, a worshiping of a particular person as opposed to uh, the particular person as embedded in the triune God, so to speak. Uh, so Jesus Christ cannot become a magic formula, whether in spirituality, whether conceptually in theology, or what have you. Uh, but that's what Bart's trying to guard against, this kind of Jesus solitary. Continuing with the quote, there is room for this word only when God as subject makes room for it, when he takes it up and speaks it. So I'll pause there again. So the distinction is between the human speaking of Jesus and the divine speaking of Jesus. In other words, Jesus considered as a human possibility and Jesus considered as a divine possibility. So Barth says only Jesus as a divine possibility can break out of this dialectic of contradiction. Only on this, I'm, I'm continuing the quote, only on this presupposition to which we should not have resort only at the last when we can do nothing else, but at the very outset, only thus is the reference to Jesus Christ anything better than an evasion. In the place which God creates as God's own word, this word can in fact be the word of reconciliation, of overcoming, of homecoming. But if it is to be such a word on our lips, we must first learn radically to renounce its compromising use as a deus ex machina, as a final resort in a not quite hopeless situation. In other words, 
Jesus only makes sense as the one who breaks out of this dialectic of contradiction. If Jesus is a word spoken by God entirely unlooked for in a hopeless situation that can conceive of no possible light. So it's it's a creation from God's side that changes the rules, that changes the dynamics. Uh, and it's, a, it's a, a word that God speaks that humanity could in no way anticipate. And this brings Bart to his fourth section on man in relation to God. And the first point that he makes is that you cannot understand humanity except in relation to God. That's a quote, except I switched him uh, for humanity. We may not and cannot understand humanity except in relation to God. Dropping a couple lines. Uh, This human being, I'm updating it again, stands before God. We know ourselves only as God makes himself known to us. And again, uh, I can't help but hear that first section of Calvin on the knowledge of God and the knowledge of humanity being inextricably linked. But Bart knows that this kind of uh, interconnection between knowledge of God and knowledge of humanity appears to be circular. Uh, you're always already in this process of moving from God to humanity, and you do not have an objective and objectifiable starting place outside of that circular motion, that dialectic of knowledge of God and knowledge of self. And Bart knows this and anticipates a number of objections. And he gets into um, some more detailed argument here. I'm going to kind of sketch the main points that he makes in response to the claim that his argument, uh, that his argument is circular. His first response is that he means the circula- circularity analytically, not synthetically. Uh, it's, it's about the starting point and starting with human beings as addressed by God. Uh, so it's not about bringing either God or humanity in as a second step. They're both there always from the start in this definition of theology that takes its cues from preaching. So that's his first point. His second point is to say that doesn't theology mean begging the question? Or as he puts it, uh, quote, what else is theology all about but not just any begging of the question, but the begging of the question par excellence? So uh, he wants to say that this just is part of what it means to be doing theology. Theology works by way of axioms. You have certain rules or certain principles that you assume to be true so that you can go on and do your inquiry. And in fact, all disciplines of thought have axioms, uh, things that they assume to be true, but they themselves cannot demonstrate. Uh, But they assume them so that they can go on uh, with the process of their work. And Bart's saying, Theology is doing the exact same thing. It presupposes what is sought. It presupposes what is sought there, uh, namely this idea of the human as addressed by God. It presupposes that, and you have to presuppose it, Bart says, because if you don't presuppose it, you're never going to find it. And so he ends this little discussion uh, by making an appeal again to the book of Romans, Romans 1.16, quote, If theology is ashamed of begging the question, of begging this question, then it is ashamed of the gospel. And this cannot have good results either in this world or the next. Now, all of this is part of Barth's extended conversation with modern liberal 19th century uh, theology, and especially with its theological method. And I don't want to belabor that any further. But Barth basically wants to move in a circle from God to humanity and back to God, rather from in a circle that starts with humanity and moves to God and then moves back to humanity. So it's, it's an extended discussion about methodological starting point, and Bart wants to be up front with the idea that he's begging the question of God and building it in from the get-go in a way that modern theologians are not. And he engages in a extended discussion of Reformed theology on pages 83 to 84 that I want to read. He's going to get into a number of the different confessions here, but I think that this might be the most important, honestly, it's about a page of material. It might be the most important page in this whole section for really articulating exactly what Bart is trying to accomplish. Because it also addresses the relationship again between theology and philosophy, but, you know, in a different way. So uh, I'm going to dive into this, and I'm sure I'll stop here or there uh, to uh, talk about it further. 
So quoting, I can best illustrate this conclusion from the history of Reformed theology. The older Reformed catechisms begin their questions and answers in contrast to what one might expect from current views of Reformed theology with the theme of this section, with man and his question. They apparently begin from below, inductively, not from above, deductively. They ask by whom or to what end we were created, Leo Judd, Emden, Micronius, or what is the end of human life, Calvin, Westminster, or what is our only comfort in life and death, Heidelberg. Note the words created, end, and comfort, which are all two-sided. Created expresses an awareness of human creatureliness, but already, even before the answer is given, it also expresses an awareness of the Creator, and hence of the meaning of creation. End means both conclusion or limit, and purpose or task. In the question about comfort lies both a knowledge of the need for it, of the total need for it, for there is only one comfort, and also of the fact that comfort exists. All these are questions, but as such, even though they are sharp and ruthless and final questions, they also document the answers that will be given. When the answers are given, they are simply analyses of the questions. And again, this is what Bart means when he says something is analytic. When the questions are given, they are simply analyses of the questions. God has created me to share his good things, to be his image, to learn to know and serve him, that he may be glorified in us. That's Calvin. With body and soul, in life and death, I am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. That's Heidelberg. Where would the questions come from if the answers were not already there? What are the questions but projections of the answers that follow them in time and logic? Those who ask the right question about God show that they already know God's answer. It is not as the prisoners of an ungodly world or their own ignorance that they ask in this way, precisely when they ask and simply ask and ask principally about the meaning of their creatureliness, about the end of human life, about their only comfort, and we might add about the overcoming of the final rift that is impossible for us. They who ask thus are prisoners of Zion, quoting from Psalm 126, God's prisoners. God has cut off every escape, bolted every door, made all accommodation impossible, so that they have to ask and can only ask, but have to ask the questions to which only God can give and be the answer, but to which he does, does give and is the answer. How else can we understand those who ask thus except in relation to God? In the question to which, as such, from a human standpoint, there is no answer, their relation to God lies. It does not mean that they have now put a bridge across the abyss. It means that the bridge has already been put there, that they are addressed by God. End quote. So again, taking from, this, taking from the get-go the idea that human beings are addressed by God uh, in Christian preaching, that's the starting point. It's the address has occurred. Um, and so when we're talking about and Barth's analyzing the existential condition of humanity as caught up in this contradiction, as uh, alienated by finitude and sin and so on, all of this is looking back. It's a post facto analysis of the human condition apart from address by God, and it's post having experienced that address. Just like what I was saying with Paul in Romans 7, you are looking back and asking questions that you would not otherwise have asked because you already know the answers. Because uh, the way that you frame now the understanding of yourself as a human being, the way that you frame now the, experience, the existential condition that you experience has been shifted precisely as the experience, that existential contradiction has been resolved in encounter with God, at least provisionally or eschatologically. So when Barth talks about the uh, theology, uh, the theological process being circular, his answers to these questions being circular, that's what he means. The questions are prompted by the answers, not the other way around. And you ask these particular questions and you answer them in these particular ways because you have been addressed by God. And so if I jump back a page and look at the bottom of page 82 to the top of page 83, this is what Bart finally has to say about uh, the circle of his theology, the circular character of it. And he asks these questions of his critics as a way of articulating them. 
quoting, If theology understands itself seriously and is to be taken seriously, can it be anything other than a fundamental begging of this question, openly undertaking as such? Can the principle of theology be sought anywhere but in God himself, and known in any way but from God himself, that is, from revelation? Can man know himself except as he is primarily known by God himself? End quote. And what Bart wants to tell us is that in the Reformed tradition, the answer to those questions is no. So, the fifth and final section, the concrete situation of preachers, uh, bringing things back to the question of how should the preacher approach the task of preaching. And so there's a very brief quote at the bottom of 84 and 85, or in the top of 85, that ties this all together. Quote, The way to the man in men is the well-considered theological begging of the question. End quote. So if preachers are to speak to what is human in the particular human people that they are addressing, the way to do that is by very carefully begging the theological question, by answering them and generating these questions within them through uh, relating the address of God, by moving through the particulars of their particular existential situation, beyond that into that basic contradiction that we only know and can articulate, ultimately, on the basis of encounter with God. So preaching is about articulating that contradiction and articulating that contradiction precisely as a contradiction that has been overcome. And that's the point that Bart makes in the first of two subpoints in this section. He says, quote, We must start with the presupposition that man knows, understands, and accepts God's word. We must not start then with his ungodliness or ignorance or incomprehension or contradiction, end quote. So what Bart is saying here, we see very clearly, and this is pretty early on, he's moving from gospel to law, not from law to gospel. It's not about preaching the wrath of God against the contradiction. It's about preaching God's overcoming of the contradiction. The contradiction is only there insofar as it is overcome by God. And so it's important to understand the contradiction The contradiction is existentially significant. It continues to be felt even in the Christian life, but is identified ultimately as overcome. And that is the good news that is God's word, that is God's address to the human situation. And for the preachers, this means, uh, Bart tells us, that we have to consider the people to whom we are preaching as in the exact same boat as us. You cannot identify the congregation as somehow less spiritual, less tuned in, less addressed by God's word than you are as the preacher. Uh, Bart says we have to assume that they are people addressed by God's word and treat them as such. That's his first point. The second point, then, is that you awaken the question or the contradiction of human existence in people. You do not try to suppress it. The sermon should not be about making people feel better about the contradiction. The sermon should be about uh, proclaiming God's overcoming of that contradiction precisely by honoring the awareness of the contradiction in that dialectic of life. Uh, The real dialectic of life, I believe the language that Bart used was uh, earlier. So, the question should not be suppressed, it should be wakened and kept awake. Consequently, quote, believers are not secure people. They are those who first know what questioning means. To be rid of the question is to be rid of revelation and not to be addressed by God or to be addressed by him no longer, end quote. So it's really those people who have a very clear sense of the contradiction in human life, who have that existential grappling with it uh, in the, on the front burner all the time. These are the people who are troubled by God's revelation, who are provoked by that revelation. Believing in God does not end that provocation. It does not resolve that contradiction. It reframes it. It reconceptualizes it in important ways, but it does not remove it because faith ultimately grows out of that contradiction where in the encounter with God's word, when God addresses us as human beings, we are awakened to the disconnect between uh, the way that God would have our lives be, the way that our lives should be, and the way that they are, in fact. And for this reason, Barth says, uh, Christians, true Christians, believers, understand atheists better than they understand themselves. 
And I think that is a very true, uh, very true statement. I forget whether it's, you know, I think it was something that one of my undergraduate professors said one time in talking about um, theology and, and the church. He said, theology should not just be elevator music. Elevator music is meant to keep you calm in an enclosed space and to keep you from worrying and stressing about your plight as you rise higher and higher over the earth, dangled from a string and a mechanical contraption that, should it fail, will plunge you stories below. Uh, it's meant to keep you calm and keep you from thinking about those things, to keep those existential questions suppressed. Theology should not be uh, Christian elevator music. And if it is, you're doing it wrong. Uh, another way that I have uh, conceptualized this for myself is perhaps you're familiar with precious moment statues, uh, those little figurines that relate uh, cute little occurrences from daily life. Uh, theology is not about precious moments in the Christian life. It should not be a theology of precious moments. It should be disruptive. It should interruptly interrupt you uh, and make you think about the world in a new way that disrupts all of your anticipations and all of your presuppositions, that disturbs the status quo of meaning in your life and drives you ever again to a reconsideration of that meaning and an in, in interrogation of the meaning that you have built in your life in light of being addressed by God. Perhaps you're familiar with existentialist comics on the internet. It's, it's a, a comic that I've uh, enjoyed uh, uh, for a while. I saw one recently that talked about uh, the basic message of the comic was existentialism at the end of the day means that each of us construct meaning in our lives and it can be anything. Uh, anything that we want to create is the meaning in our lives, and there's a lot of truth to that. Christian existentialism, however, means that you construct meaning in a certain way, that you construct it on the basis of encounter with God. And so every subsequent encounter, every attempt at theology, every time this question is brought up again and we are forced to give an answer, it means constructing a certain kind of meaning in our life, constructing meaning in our life on the basis of the encounter with God that pulls us out of ourselves, grounds us not in ourselves. We give up that uh, constant seeking of security in our own lives, in all those other things that Bart talked about, whether it was the bourgeois approach, the proletarian approach, uh, nationalism, morality, devotion. Uh, all of these things are false securities. True Christian preaching drives us out of those false securities, out of that precious moments theology, and into a disruptive encounter with God so that believers are not secure people. They are those who first know what questioning means. You've been listening to the McCracken Cast. I am and hopefully will remain Dr. Travis McMacken. I do all the production work myself, in case you couldn't tell. But the music is by my son, Connor. Until next time, think interesting thoughts. Thank you.